Hello and welcome back to Lyric Hi-Fi in Belfast in May 2021. And we're here today, we're going to talk about vinyl records and how they're made and a little bit of history. And we're just going to go through it as, as we go along. So um, housekeeping first, uh, if you enjoy this do subscribe, like, all that, follow. Um, I normally go on for far too long. I'm sure most of you will leave halfway through, so that's why you should like it now before you leave. Um, anyway, to go on. Recording, music, the things we love. That's why Lyric Hi-Fi is here. How did we get to the stage of playing music? So recorded music, there are various different um, people saying about different uh, inventors who had ways of recording music. Most people would say it was the Edison cyl cylinder player was the first commercial wax cylinder that a little needle went into and as it turned you got the, the vibrations um, and then followed by gramophones in 78s. Um, but let me actually go back a wee bit before that because just before that where you're going maybe 150 years ago if Mr. Uh, let's say Chopin uh, had a nice new piece of music or Debussy had invented, had written a new piece of music, La Mer, and he premiered it in Paris. And if you wanted to hear this lovely piece of music that was maybe talked about in newspapers, you had to go to Paris. Not like Spotify these days, you had to actually go there to hear it. And if you missed it because the boat was late, you couldn't get the train, oh, that's a disaster because the next time it's going to be played is three weeks later in Vienna. So you better get yourself to Vienna. And so music of that type was for rich people. And the recording industry started to bring the culture of music and lots of music to the masses, to everyone, to make it accessible. Now a record player still cost a fortune in those days, and a gramophone in the early 1900s. So it still wasn't uh, a mass market product, but it was a way that people could actually hear what was going on and hear historical music as well, recordings of, of Beethoven and early music and everything like that. Uh, so I digress there, but we come back to uh, 78s. Now, these are 78s in a lovely little case made for 78s. And these things are really heavy. And they're made of shellac. And they're mostly 10 inch. And they're 78 RPM. And a thorn or a steel needle goes into those and vibrates a little diaphragm through a horn. And it was a very clever piece of technology. This is from uh, his master's voice. You can see from the little doggy listening to the horn. And these were coming in from the 1920s, 30s, 40s. In fact, production of some of these stayed until well into the uh, 50s. But in 1948, there was an invention that would replace these. So, 1948, what happened? Uh, after the war, lots of engineers uh, working, wanted to work on something new, something useful. And so they started working in the music industry and recording industry. Um, and engineers from Columbia in the United States invented the micro groove record. Okay. Now one of these things really could only run up to about seven or eight minutes aside. So trying to listen to a, a symphony of works means you had a wee carrying case to bring it to your friend's house to, to listen to this stuff. The micro groove record at that stage was uh, uh, able to go up to 22 minutes per side. And that was incredible because that basically meant you could get a symphony of music onto a single LP. Many symphonies come out at around about 40, 45 minutes. Or if it's a, an opera, you're going into double albums and things like that with multiples of this. But the microgroove record changed everything. Now, whenever you put these grooves really closely together, you actually um, lose bass performance and low frequencies. So at the same time, there was a thing invented called the RIAA equalization curve. Geeks, just if you're not geeky like me, just fast forward. 
There's a more interesting bit coming up. But whenever you've got a turntable and you need a phono stage or something with a phono input, that's because of this equalization. So what they did was they tilted the curve. Here's a curve that there's less bass and more treble. And so it got cut onto the record in that um, ratio. And whenever you play it all back, there's an exact curve to do the opposite, to balance it up again. So that's why that's, that, that's why you have your phono stage, and that's why an equalization curve had to be made. Now, actually, there were different equalizations. Without going too geeky, um, the RIAA was the standard one, but actually some different record companies in the early days had their own. Um, RIAA is Record Industry of America something else. Forgotten. Anyway, that's still to this day the standard curve of records. Now, with these grooves closer together, you could get more, as I say, uh, length on them. But if it was a shorter um, piece of music and the grooves are slightly more spaced, you could have more dynamic range, you could have more volume in them. So people started to be able to play about with improving the quality of records as well. And whenever we fast forward into the 1960s and 70s, the opposite reason came for making them closer together, which is to get more tracks on and to cut the bass and to deliberately do away with the bass. So the famous um, people said, oh, I bought, now that's what I call Music 47, and it didn't sound as good as the original ones in the album. I suppose they chopped off lots of the bass to fit, you know, 20 tracks of music into a standard album. So you could play about with how wide the grooves were, how deep the grooves were, what your dynamic range was with all this, to get the best possible sound. So you had people moving forward in the 50s and 60s with higher quality recordings, and also with more quality in the cutting and mastering stage. At the recording stage, some of the leaders of this were people like Decca and uh, EMI. So these EMI classical recordings, if you see one that has recording engineer and producer Christopher Bishop and Christopher Parker, just buy it. It will be one of the best sounding albums you've ever got. If you have something like in the 1950s, the recording engineers of people like Rudy Van Gelder working for people like Blue Note and Verve. And you look at these albums with the great, you know, Ben Webster, these kind of things, Ella and Louie from those eras. Fantastic recording engineer, fantastic attention to detail in the recording process. Um, as music got more popular and you got volumes in the 60s and in the 70s, 60s and 70s, sometimes the quality went down. And you also find that in the 1970s, the quality of vinyl went down because of the oil crisis, where you didn't have as much vinyl, so recycled vinyl came about, and it was much lower quality. Anyway, that's all by the by, because the other thing here in front of me, which people go, well, what's that? What, what's, what's that? What does that play on? Um, this is an acetate. An acetate is what you make a record from. So whenever you've recorded your album, and you've got it on tape in 1960, whatever, you need to turn that into a way of making a record. And the way of making a record, first of all, is that you've got to cut it onto an acetate. So this is the reverse of having a record, having a needle and a cartridge that vibrates and produces a sig signal out to your amplifier. This is the other way around. So the best lathe was a scully lathe, and in a scully lathe, You've got a turntable and a head. You put the head on this, the signal comes in and cuts the groove into that. Now, the reason why I've got these test pressings about is that the engineer could cut these and listen back to them because you can play these on a normal record player. And the sound is absolutely fantastic because it's a higher uh, dynamic range and clarity than a record because this is what a record is made from. So. Whenever the engineer was cutting these, he played about with the spacing of the grooves, how deep they were, but also being able to get the music that he wanted fit, physically fitting onto the thing. So whenever you've made this, the acetate is not as stable as a final record. And usually when that was cut, it had to be refrigerated and put in a bag and taken to the next stage, which is the mastering. And this would be electroplated. You can see that's flat on the other side, 
the grooves cut on that side and then you apply electrodes to it because it's metal in the middle and you plate that. And whenever that is plated, that then is stable. And then the reverse of that is made into a stamper and the stamper then is what stamps the vinyl together to give your record. Now that uh, means that it's limited if you only get one stamper from these. So of course, whenever mass production came along in the 60s, whenever this was plated, then you got to a situation where you were able to make multiples of the positives of this and from those make extra, what we call mothers. And so one cut, instead of being able to make one or 2,000 records, would be able to make 100,000 records. So that's why this was then possible to uh, make far, far bigger quantities. Also, whenever I was geeky and collecting records in the 1980s, I actually wanted to buy a record from the country that it was recorded in. I'm um, sorry, I'm getting even more geeky again, because the original master tape never left the country. So whenever you're recording in the UK of um, a particular band and you're you going to then sell it in the States, you would have a copy of the master tape. You wouldn't ship records to the States. You would have a copy of the master tape, ship it over to uh, the US, and somebody there would then do another cut there from that and do their own masters. But the copy master tape was never as good. So whenever I wanted to have the best possible copy of uh, Joe Cocker Sheffield Steel, amazing album um, recorded in um, uh, NASA, I think it's uh, in the Bahamas, and then mastered in New York at Sterling Sound. I had to, when I was in the States, actually buy a copy over there because I had one up on everybody else because I would be able to have a copy that was mastered there from the original master tape. There are all kinds of different things like this with, which happened, which affected the quality of records through all these uh, eras. Also in the middle of this, I'm going to talk a little bit about seven inch singles because we all think they were rubbish, hated them to bits. Um, but there were actually seven inch singles of this, of the Stray Cats and pop music. And these were frankly, pretty damn ropey. Previous to that, you'd ones in beautiful cases that were beautifully made. So you could buy a single of Nat King Cole or Ella Fitzgerald or whatever. And that could have been really good quality. But the market for singles that drove the music industry on through the 60s, 70s and 80s was all predicated on these. And so we all thought those are rubbish and why would you ever buy one? And then of course you go come to today and some of these albums play at 45. So what's going on there, Michael? How does that make any sense at all? The problem isn't the 45. The problem was that these are just crap. Actually, if you're gonna cut the record at a faster speed, you can't have as long time, but you can have a deeper groove with a shorter time and a higher dynamic range. So this album of Dar Straits Communique, which I bought in the 1980s for, mm, let's guess, six or seven quid, maybe eight quid, um, has been reissued by a company called Mobile Fidelity Sound Labs that makes some of the most amazing recordings. And what they've done is gone back to the original master tapes, and instead of cutting it at 33, so it all fits in one album, they've cut it very carefully at 45, which means you have to have two albums, which you might think is maybe a pain in the butt because you have to get up every 10 minutes and turn it over, but the sound of it is amazing. The other thing is also amazing is the price, because of 79 pounds for that, uh, for a limited edition disc, but it is probably one of the highest quality discs you will ever find. Apart from musical uh, Mobile Fidelity's even higher series, like this, which is a Stevie Ray Vaughan album, Couldn't Stand the Weather, um, which uh, I've got a few originals of, and it's an amazing thing. But whenever I told you about the different processes we went through with the making one mother, sort of one, one master to another master to another master. This is a one process, so that you don't have the ability to make lots and lots of albums. And in fact, in this, it was limited edition. The limited edition is limited to 8,000, of which this is number 4,824. Um, and that is a mouth-watering 179 pounds. And 
the only thing that would cheer you up about that is because there only are ever going to be a limited number, um, that run is virtually sold out. It's sold out already at Mobile Fidelity. There are still some available, but these will change hands for maybe twice that on the internet at some time. So um, that's a little bit different. It's like buying shares in Tesla or whatever that go up through the roof. Um, but uh, for my money, it's actually for playing. There are other companies that are making very high quality albums as well. So there's a company in Germany called Speakers Corner and they will do uh, a completely analog um, new cut of a record. They only do analog recordings, but they're typically what, 29, 30 quid for a really high quality album. And while people think that's an awful lot, well, you'd pay an awful lot more for a video game. So I think if you really love it, then it's still worth doing. So um, I think that's probably enough about records. If you want to find out any more about this, or if you have a question, certainly ask me a question. I'm not sure if I've covered everything, but this gives you a feel about how a record's put together. Now, once you've done all that, you've then got to think, how do you get that detail, that information that's been carefully put onto the vinyl back out again? And that's when we talk about turntables and cartridges and how all of that works to extract the most from the groove. If you think about it like this, a stylus travels down a record and covers 1,500 feet on that. Four, 450 meters, if you think in terms of metric. And that's going as it flies down this. It's like going down a bobsleigh run. That's what's going on. And it's getting moved from side to side. And every movement is a tiny voltage. And every movement is a bit of how do you get the best sound out of the bobsleigh groove so that you hear exactly what Puccini wanted, Ray Cooter wanted, Ben Webster, Van Morrison. The information they put in the studio, the information that was cut into that vinyl how do we get that out again? So that'll probably be the next video because I've talked enough for now. Thank you very much for watching. Hope to see you again soon. Do subscribe and we'll let you know when the next premiere will be. Thanks very much for watching. We enjoy doing these things. That's quite a, a wee quick blast through a history of recording. We've more topics to do. So please do subscribe and uh, watch again on the next one. Um, thanks for watching. Hope to see you real soon. Cheers.